Okay, everyone, it looks like um, the, the entrances have started to slow down, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome. Um, we're really pleased tonight to have our friend Mary Culler be presenting to us about Missouri stream teams and their water quality data over a couple decades here in Missouri. Right before we get started, um, I know that we have a lot of returning attendees, but in case this is your first webinar with us, um, we are the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Um, our mission is the conservation of Missouri's birds and their habitats. Um, and we do this in a variety of ways that you can see right here. And if you'd like to know a little bit more about our organization, you can just look at mrbo.org. Um, I do wanna mention that We've been doing this weekly Tuesday night webinar series for many, many, many weeks now, I think 30 weeks or something like that. Um, and we are taking election day off from webinars and then we'll be back again um, the following week and we'll have uh, the new webinar schedule out to everyone quite soon. So a couple sort of housekeeping things about Zoom. Um, I know a lot of folks are super familiar with us right now. But just in case, um, the main functions that you as webinar attendees are going to be able to use are the chat and the Q&A. Um, just so you know, we cannot see you or hear you as attendees, um, so don't worry about that. Um, if you want to chat, um, if there's some resources um, that we can provide or that Mary wants us to provide, one of us will put those in the chat. And if you have any technical difficulties, please go ahead and ask questions and we'll try and answer them there. Um, and then the other function is the Q&A. So go ahead and, and be typing questions into the Q&A box as you think of them. And then we'll take all questions at the end. So Mary's gonna tell us a little bit more about her own background, um, but she is a good friend, someone that we admire her and her work um, with the Missouri Stream Team Watershed Coalition. Um, that's her on the right. I believe, Mary, that that's you in COVID scuba gear uh, handing out granola bars um, during a recent river event. And uh, one of the things that I most appreciate about Mary's work with Stream Teams United is their weekly um, update of, of all things water in Missouri. And so it's got, it's just a really good compilation of articles, legislative news, upcoming events. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in the chat a little bit later. Um, I highly recommend signing up for that. I get a lot of info that way. And so that's something that we love. So with no further ado, I shall stop sharing and hand it over to Mary. Mary, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Dana. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, yeah, good. Well, it's great to see you, Dana, Ethan, and Paige. And I can't see anyone else that's that's on this program tonight, but really appreciate you joining us and appreciate the Missouri River Bird Observatory for uh, letting us share some information with you tonight. I'm going to uh, give a perspective on water quality and also highlight some of the stream team water quality data that we have here in Missouri. The topic of water quality in general for the whole state of Missouri would be hard to cover in just one hour. And it's really a topic that would be hard to do a real comprehensive review on in several days. You know, So we could talk about Missouri's water quality over the course of days and weeks. Of course, we can't do that tonight, but I'm gonna provide some information on the process we use in Missouri and tools where you can learn more. And then again, talk about what we've learned from the first 24 years that volunteers have been collecting data in the state of Missouri. Uh, a little bit about my background and where I'm coming from with this. Uh, I grew up in the James River Basin. That's my hometown watershed in Southwest Missouri, Springfield. And in the 1990s, there was a big algae bloom in the James River arm of Table Rock Lake uh, due to nutrients coming out of the city of Springfield. And so following that event in the 90s, the James River Basin Partnership formed, and they're one of the local stream teams that continues to this day in Southwest Missouri. And so that, that pollution event in my 
hometown watershed was really one of the starting things that helped get me interested in water quality. And, and so I've been studying and working in water quality since the, since the 90s. My background is as a fisheries biologist. So I've spent um, you know, the better part of a decade doing fisheries research. And then I also worked for the Department of Natural Resources uh, doing water quality monitoring and permit work and water quality planning. And I've served in this role as in Stream Teams United as the director for almost three years. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and talk a little bit about our organization. And then we will get into the rest of the program. First, Stream Teams United, who are we? Uh, we're a nonprofit in the state of 501c3. The Missouri Stream Team Program was formed in 1989. So last year, the Stream Team Program celebrated its 30th anniversary. It started with Stream Team number one, Ruby Doo Fly Fishers near Waynesville. Uh, 10 years after the Missouri St Stream Team Program started, our organization began as a coalition of regional stream teams that are working together in their local watershed. So I should say starting out that the stream team program uh, is sponsored by the Missouri Department of Conservation, Department of Natural Resources, and the Conservation Federation of Missouri. And they are the founding sponsors of the program that continue to uh, host and provide support for the program. And our organization uh, was formed 10 years after the main program as a coalition of regional volunteer stream teams. So today we have 22 stream team associations located throughout the state of Missouri. And in 2017, we adopted a new trade name, Stream Teams United. So um, we use both of those terms a little bit interchangeably. The Missouri Stream Team Watershed Coalition is our legal name and our doing business as name is Stream Teams United. These are our 22 stream team associations in the state. And so we have the stream team associations through, throughout the state, uh, one located in northern Missouri, one in the Boot Hill, several located in the Ozarks, southwest Missouri, several in the St. Louis region, Columbia, and Kansas City. And so the map that I showed on the previous slide is available on our website if you go to streamteamsunited.org. We have information about how to reach and connect with all of these stream team organizations. And also, you can also form a new stream team association. So if there's an area of the state that does not have an association that's active, that's always something that we're looking to try to help facilitate. So what do we do? So as the non-government uh, organization that partners with the stream team program. We help to promote and support the stewardship of Missouri stream resources. Our mission is the same as the Missouri stream team programs, three main goals of education, advocacy, and stewardship for Missouri streams. And we're made up of Missouri citizens that care about Missouri streams. So we facilitate communication. Dana was saying we, uh, we have our weekly e-bulletin we send out on Fridays. Um, also, we get the word out through social media, um, workshops, events, and so forth. Uh, we administer and apply for grants for projects that um, can be done by our member stream team associations. And we collaborate with those regional stream team associations on various projects uh, that benefit their local watershed. And so, you know, another thing is utilizing our 501c3 status for donations, grants, and purchases for stream team associations. Um, so one of the things I was working on today was uh, purchasing some cleanup supplies for a stream team association in the St. Louis region so they can better do cleanups in their area. And then also as a non-government uh, partner, we lead stream team advocacy efforts for clean water and stream resources in Missouri. So I just wanna highlight a few of our projects that we've done over the last uh, 20 years. 
And first, the Missouri Clean Marina program was a program that we began with the Stream Team Association down at Table Rock and Lake Taney Como. They're known as the Ozarks Water Watchers. And that's a program to um, provide a designation to marinas that basically show that they are caring for their lake that they're located at. And it also provides education and outreach to people that are visiting those lakes. We provide various educational supplies and also, as I was mentioning earlier, work on different grant projects with local stream teams. Also tire reimbursement. Um, many stream teams go out and you know, pick up trash and tires. And then after you have a heap of tires, there's always the question, well, what do we do with these? Well, we have the ability to work with the Department of Natural Resources to uh, receive funds and then reimburse stream teams for the cost of disposal of tires. A few of our other projects, as Dana mentioned earlier, we have our weekly update that comes out on Fridays. During the legislative session, we include um, a what we call the legislative lookout or the advocacy watch, and that includes information about bills that are moving through the state legislature that have an importance to stream teams because they have something to do with water or natural resources or public land. As Dana was showing in that uh, picture earlier, that was a picture of me on our most recent Palomo Ozarks trip. We began the Palomo program in 2016 as an educational river journey that begins in Herman and ends in St. Louis, five days, 100 miles. And so we just completed the fifth annual Palomo trip, but then last year we expanded that educational um, program to the Upper Current River, which, which is in the Ozark National Scenic Riverways. And then finally, one of our other uh, projects that we've worked on in the last several years is a summary of the Stream Team Volunteer Water Quality Monitoring Data. And I'm going to go into a little bit more depth on that tonight. Okay, and most recently, we are serving as a sponsor of an AmeriCorps project. And with this, we're hosting AmeriCorps members around the state at several of our uh, regional stream team associations. We're hosting AmeriCorps members currently at sites in Kansas City, Springfield, and Columbia. And we're looking to host a members soon in the St. Louis region. And that project is anticipated to go for another couple of years. So uh, if you're on the line and know anyone that might want to volunteer as an AmeriCorps member, we have um, information about that on our website. And finally, our role related to advocacy. Um, again, as the non-government partner of the Stream Team Program, we can host and co-host advocacy workshops. We attend and watch Clean Water Commission meetings and other public meetings and provide comment when, when needed. And then during the legislative session, we track bills, like I mentioned, and then provide that information out to Missouri stream teams. If there's an upcoming hearing or an issue for which uh, stream teams might want to voice their opinion on, we work to try to get that information out so people are aware of what's going on at both the state and federal levels. Okay, so now to talk about the main topic of the night, and that is water quality in Missouri. And I'm just checking my chat box real quick to make sure um, I don't have any current questions. I think we look good there. Okay, so the topic of water quality in Missouri. Again, like I said, that's a very large topic that's really hard to cover within one hour, but I'm gonna provide some information on the process and some tools to learn more. And so in thinking about water quality in Missouri, you may have some questions like, how is the local water quality of your nearby stream? How is the regional water quality of your larger watershed? And then how is Missouri's water quality as a state? Okay, so let's talk about the process for determining water quality problems in Missouri. 
So in Missouri, we have over 115,000 classified miles of streams. So again, 115,000 classified miles of streams. For each of those uh, miles of streams, there are assigned what's called designated uses. And designated, designated uses are basically how the how the river, how the water is used by either people or aquatic life or animals in general. And so some examples of designated uses include warm water habitat, which is basically going to be any river that supports life. Another example is cold water habitat. Cold water habitat is for, for rivers that support um, trout, and um, basically species that have to have colder water to survive. Whole body contact recreation is basically swimming. Secondary contact recreation is where you're not swimming in the water, but you're wading, fishing, doing anything where your hands are contacting the water, but, but you're not being completely immersed in the water. Human health protection is related to the consumption of fish, irrigation, livestock and wildlife protection, drinking water supply, and other uses. So for all of those 115,000 miles of classified streams, they're designated a use based on where they're at and how they're used by people or animals. And that also goes to say for, for lakes, we have um, about 319,000 acres of classified um, lake acres in the state. And so all of our classified lakes also are assigned designated, designated uses. So the first step, like I said, is designated uses. The second step, Missouri has what are known as water quality standards for various water quality parameters. And the, they are listed in the Code of State regulations at that link. And I think we'll have this posted. So I'll, I have several links within this um, program tonight and you'll be able to find them uh, later or I can provide some information to the attendees. And so the water quality standards are basically the limits for certain pollutants and they include a lot of different pollutants, metals, inorganic substances, bacteria, oxygen, pH, organic substances, pesticides, ammonia. And the various standards are based on the use of the water body. So if you have a drinking water supply, it's going to have more strict um, water quality standards than if you have a body of water that's not being used for drinking water. The third step, water quality data is then collected by a variety of groups. And there are many groups that collect water quality across the state. It's done by our state agencies, the federal government, uh, local groups such as counties collect water quality information, universities, and stream team volunteers. Okay, so once we have all of that water quality data, it's evaluated through a process that's outlined in the state's methodology for development of the 303D list. And this document is uh, basically says, you know, how do we take all this data and determine whether or not a stream is impaired? And impaired means it's not meeting the state's water quality standards. So this methodology document, you can access this on the DNR's website. It's 83 pages long, and it's a pretty complex document. But our, our friends at DNR use this document, and they, they send out a request for data every couple years, and they review all of this data. If a stream has enough data to be evaluated, and if it shows, if the data shows that it's not meeting one of the state's water quality standards, the stream is then placed on the state's 303D list. And the 303D list is simply the list of streams in the state that are not meeting water quality standards. 
And so that list is created every two years. It's placed on public comment. And uh, then uh, the Missouri Department of Natural Resources submits that list to the EPA every two years. And they can offer edits to that list. Um, and then they ultimately approve the list. Streams can also be removed from the list every two years if there's new data that shows that there's no longer an impairment. Our current 2020 303D uh, list has 481 separate water body pollutant impairment pairs, you could say. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of how many uh, streams and impairments are on the list. Our 2020 currently has 481. And that's something um, later after I, I present the main part, if you have a certain stream you want information on, I will say go ahead and put that in the chat box and we may have time to delve a little bit more into answering some questions about local water quality. So the next step in the process is Streams that land on that 303D list are scheduled to have a total maximum daily load study written. And that's also a process that's done by DNR and it, the TMDL studies go on public notice and then eventually they're submitted to the EPA for approval. This total maximum daily load study basically calculates what the allowable pollutant loads would be from point and non-point sources. So this is basically the effort to determine what needs to be done to be able to remove a stream from a 303D list. Okay, the next step is the 305B report. And the 305B report is basically the most comprehensive report about Missouri's uh, water quality and the state provides that to EPA every year. And so that's something, if you're interested in learning more about the state's water quality, that document would be what I would suggest to, to dive into. It, it's 274 pages long, but I'll tell you a lot of that is our, our appendices. And so really the, the first part of it's 52 pages. So it is manageable. And after you, you read that, um, it'll give you much more information about the current state of, of water quality in Missouri. If a stream is on the 303D list and has a total maximum daily load written, it then comes off the 303D list and goes into that 305B report. Uh, the 305B reports are collected from each state and then combined into one national water quality inventory report that goes to Congress. And I will say that this National Water Quality Inventory Report is, uh, the, the latest I saw was from 2017. I could not find in, in my efforts a national report that's more recent than 2017, and it was only 22 pages. Uh, so it gets whittled down quite a bit when it's sent to Congress, uh, but it gives some broad um, overviews of some of the main water quality problems in the nation. Okay, so to answer that first question, how is local water quality of my nearby stream? Well, the first question is, is there data? And that's something to think about. Um, now, there's various sources where you can find data for your local stream. I've included one link here. This link goes to the Department of Natural Resources website where you can search by county, you can search by the name of a stream. Um, you know, there's a lot of bear creeks in Missouri. There's a lot of turkey creeks in Missouri. So I would suggest searching by county first. And I've found a few broken links on the Department of Natural Resources website trying to get to this spot that I know this, this link is working. Now, talking about is there data is something really important to think about because um, there are many streams that don't have any data or they don't have enough data in order to be properly assessed. I mentioned earlier that there are 115,000 miles of classified streams 
in Missouri. Of that 115,000 miles of classified streams, the last time uh, our state did an assessment, we only had enough uh, data on 11,600 miles of those classified streams. So roughly only 10% of our classified streams in the state have had in 2020 or when they did the 2020 review uh, enough data in order to be assessed. So there's a chance there's not data for your local stream, in which case that's a great opportunity to become involved as a citizen science as a Missouri Stream Team volunteer and collect data for your local watershed. Another way to figure out is there data is through the Stream Team's interactive map and that's located at moststreamteam.org. And this map has several layers to it. Um, it has information about stream team activities, which could be litter pickups, tree planting activities, educational events, but then it also has water quality monitoring that's done by local stream teams. There's also layers that uh, come from DNR's database related to permitted facilities, such as wastewater treatment facilities, CAFOs, uh, stormwater permits. So it's a good tool to find out first what stream team activity is going on in your watershed and then also um, different potential sources of pollution. And thank you, Dana, for posting that in the chat. You're hard to keep up with, Mary, but I'm going to I'm going to try. <laughs> Okay, so water quality studies in Missouri. And this is where, you know, there's just, there's so much data out there. I can say that, you know, what I just said is sometimes there's not enough data. And that's true, there's not enough data to really assess all the streams in Missouri. Like I said, only 10% of streams had enough data. But at the same time, for someone trying to learn about all the data in Missouri, there, there's a lot of different places to go. DNR within their environmental services program has what's called their water quality, um, I think I said measurement section here, I think it might be monitoring section, water quality monitoring section. And they have a variety of reports and links there. So if you go to dnr.mo.gov um, and look up their environmental services program, ESP water quality monitoring, there's information about aquatic bioassessments I'll, I'll go back, uh, weightable stream surveys, fish tissue monitoring. And that's done, of course, for human fish consumption advisories. Uh, there's data for water quality at state park beaches. Harmful algal blooms is something that's come up more recently in the last few years is, is toxic algae blooms and trying to monitor and get a handle on those. So that's another website I would recommend. Again, um, we can go to these some of these sites if we have time at the end, but DNR does have uh, one website here that has pulled together various links like I'm talking about. So it's kind of a one stop website or web page for finding various links to all the other data from various organizations um, such as the USGS, the Conservation Department. I'd also like to mention the Lakes of Missouri Volunteer Program. And with our lakes, we have about 320,000 acres of classified uh, lake acres in the state. Now, when we were able to do, or when, I, when DNR did the assessment of lakes uh, most recently, they had data on almost 270,000 acres. So about 83% of the classified acres had enough data to be assessed. And that is, um, we, have, we have the work at the University of Missouri to, to thank for that amount of data. Um, the limnology program uh, at the University of Missouri, and, and there, there's other partners, I'm sure, and, and the Army Corps of Engineers that collects data. But we have a lot of information on lakes uh, because some of the work that the University of Missouri does in their long-term lake uh, monitoring program. They also have this Lakes of Missouri Volunteer Program, 
which is a citizen science uh, collection of water quality samples. And so that's a good resource, this lmvp.org, to find out information about various lakes. And the last website I'm going to mention here is the National Water Quality Monitoring Council, and they have this water quality portal. And that's a website you can go to to search for uh, water quality data and all of the data that's collected by the states and the federal government is um, funneling into this portal kind of as a main place to search for data. Okay, so just kind of to review here, you know, how is local water quality of my nearby stream? How, if you wanted to answer that question, one of the first things you could do is check the current 303D list for the state to see which streams in your county are impaired. But then, as I said, if there wasn't enough data for your local stream, it may not have been assessed. So just because your local stream is not on the 303D list does not mean that it's um, perfectly fine. There just may not be the data to be able to assess it. You can also check the list of TMDLs, which is on the DNR's website, to see if your local stream or um, any streams in your county have had a TMDL written. There are many interactive maps and I've provided, provided a link for that on the, the DNR website. There are a lot of maps where you can search to see um, visually for impaired streams, TMDLs, how streams are classified, um, sources of pollution and so forth. Okay, this last tool, EPA's How's My Waterway is at mywaterway.epa.gov. And the EPA just recently rebuilt this website and it's really good. They, they improved this tool tremendously, I think, in my opinion. Uh, so that's something that if anyone does have um, a question about their local stream, we can maybe check that out later. But um, I would encourage everyone to go that after, after the program's over tonight, go to mywaterway.epa.gov and you can search by your county, your address, your local stream. And there's an interactive map that pops up that also has links to um, a lot of data. So you can also access a lot of different files and, and information about your stream. Okay, so after we get back past the question of how is my local stream, you might ask the question, how is Missouri's water quality data? And this is also something, this, this website or this picture I have here, I know it's a little bit small for you to see, but this comes from that same EPA website, the mywaterway.epa.gov. And in, on this website, you can also search by state. And the different topics you can search by are swimming, eating fish, aquatic life, drinking water. Um, I pulled this up because this graph basically illustrates, this graph shows lakes and reservoirs for whole body contact, which is swimming. Okay, and this, this graph shows that basically, the green part, 223,000 acres, uh, were determined to be good for whole body contact recreation. Now, what they're probably evaluating there is bacteria. So, uh, you know, this amount had low bacteria, but this number of acres, 93,000, had insufficient information. So, there's, that's just to illustrate that, you know, we can't really evaluate a body of water if we don't have any data on it. This next graph shows rivers and streams for the use of whole body contact recreation in the state. And what I wanted to point out here, again, we're looking at bacteria when they're talking about swimming. They've got about 2,500 miles that are good, 2,600 that are impaired, but then this large number, 109,000 um, miles, that are, is insufficient data, okay? So for a lot of our parameters, um, it's really hard to say, you know, what all of Missouri looks like when we only have 
data on 10% of the streams. Okay. I have one question in the panel about is the EPA water quality a daily new report or weekly? Um, so the mywaterway.epa.gov I would say is not uh, daily and it's probably not weekly either. It's being updated periodically, but I'm not sure what that um, frequency is. But I would say it's probably it's probably not even weekly. Um, it may be a quarterly or every six month update. Okay. So now I'm gonna dive a little bit into Missouri Stream Team and volunteer water quality monitoring. I am just really proud to be a part of this Missouri Stream Team uh, program network and have the opportunity to work with so many Stream Team volunteers. This, this slide just shows the impact of the Stream Team program in 30 years. And you know, 6,000 citizen Stream Teams, over 3 million volunteer hours. 13,000 tons of trash removed from Missouri watersheds. And you all can read the rest. But here when we talk about water quality monitoring, over 32,000 water quality monitoring trips. So we obviously know a lot more about our state's water quality because of the Stream Team program than we would uh, if, if the Stream Team program didn't exist. And it's provided us with a lot of great information and it continues to do that. The Stream Team program has several different levels of training, and these are offered by various workshops that are taught by staff at DNR and the Conservation Department. So the levels of training are introductory, level one, level two, level three. And as far as using Stream Team water quality data, um, when volunteers reach the level two and level three, uh, areas of expertise, their data that they collect is used um, by the state agencies to establish uh, baseline information for streams and to um, help screen to see if there's potentially water quality problems. And then stream teams that are of uh, level three can and potentially level two. I have some stream team staff on the line, so we'll have to ask them that question. But CSI projects are basically special projects in a local watershed um, where uh, stream teams collect data mostly related to bacteria that can also be used in that 303D assessment. Okay, so I'm going to speak about the summary of the volunteer water quality monitoring data. The stream team program began in 1989, but then the water quality monitoring portion of that began in 1993. Uh, so in about 2010, there was the thought like, okay, we have 17 years of stream team data. We need to really summarize this and get a look at what our volunteer data is showing. And so Stream Teams United helped to facilitate a summary report that was published in 2011. Uh, and this report was updated uh, in 2018 using the first 24 years of data collected by volunteers from 1993 through 2016. This report is available on our Stream Teams United website at streamteamsunited.org. And as part of this report, um, I will say the data was analyzed and, and crunched by uh, Dan Obrek and Tony Thorpe at the University of Missouri, and they are also the individuals that work with the Lake of Missouri um, Volunteer Program and the Statewide Lake Assessment Program. So thanks to Dan and Tony, we have a really nice report that's available on our website looking at that 24 years of water quality data. For that report, they broke the state into 13 different regions. The data that was collected by level two or higher uh, stream team volunteers was used. And so this included chemistry at over 627 sites and macroinvertebrate samples at 413 sites. Now, one of the things that was important to note is that the data was, was used only if there were multiple samples. 
And so that's something important. You know, if, if someone goes out and takes a single sample of water quality, um, that provides a snapshot of what the river looks like at that moment in time. But water quality can be very variable. It can be very variable uh, due to changes in the season, changes in the flow of the water, changes in temperature, uh, rain. All of these things can affect water quality. So from any water quality collection standpoint, it's much more beneficial if you can get multiple samples over, um, over time. And so the, the stream team data was evaluated to only include the data where there were um, several monitoring events over several years. The stream team chemistry data um, was basically um, compared to what we call screening levels. And so this table shows various parameters. And so for, for all the water chemistry data collected by stream team volunteers, at each site, they came up with an average value to represent that site, and then they compared it to these screening levels. And so instead of looking for, say, trends over time, it was more of a pass-fail. And these uh, screening criteria are related to the water quality standards in the state. For the invertebrate, uh, collection. And so that's something that I know stream teams, if you're on the line, you know, stream teams do two basic types of monitoring. They collect macroinvertebrates to determine what the health of the biology is in the stream. And then they also collect water chemistry data. But for the invertebrate data, basically what was done was the, um, the invertebrate values, they looked at each site and they took the, the annual maximum, so the maximum value for the year, and those were averaged for all of, all of the data at that site. So then the site got a final invertebrate score. And so for each region, the report creates a basically a score to say, are the, is the health in the stream looking poor, fair, good, or excellent? Okay, so we're gonna go real quickly through these 13 regions and just some of the main highlights that this report showed from the stream team data. And I will say, you know, this report is on our website and something you can do is go to the region that you live in. And for each region, there's a table that has all of the water quality parameters, parameters that were evaluated and it provides the average and the median value. So if you're wondering, what's the typical dissolved oxygen level in a stream near me? Or what's the typical pH or nitrate level? For each of these regions, there's a table in, in the report that can lead you to that information. So the first region we're gonna talk about, the um, Nishnabotna, Platte, Green, and Sheridan Rivers in Northwest Missouri. Um, and the main highlight from this region was that uh, there were some problems with, with nitrate and ammonia. Roughly about a fifth of the sites um, had values that exceeded that screening criteria. And then about a third of the sites had higher turbidity levels. So, you know, I think this is, these are historically prairie streams. Uh, there's, there's soil impact and, and runoff um, in this area. And so, that was definitely um, shown in the data. Now, something I will mention with stream team sites, you know, these are not randomly chosen. So stream team volunteers pick sites that are either uh, near where they live, convenient to sample, or maybe they're um, at public accesses. So that, because they're not randomly selected, that can affect the um, outcome of the data and if, if, some of this, uh, if some of the samples were collected as part of a study, which we'll get to when we're in the St. Louis region, that, that also can um, affect some of the data. In Northeast Missouri, we saw there were um, lower invertebrate scores in general. Uh, the report also looked at different parameters and how they might um, influence the biology in the stream. And in this part of Missouri, uh, they found that sites with higher nitrate values tended to have lower invertebrate scores. 
you see this region was unique in that it had uh, quite a few sites in the St. Louis region and then other sites that are were more in rural part of Northeast Missouri. In the Blackwater, Lamine, Osage, and South Grand Rivers, those streams had more of an invertebrate uh, score that was average or fair. And about a fifth of the sites had higher turbidity levels. In the Ozark region, and this region included parts of St. Louis, but about a fourth of the assessed sites exceeded the screening criteria for chloride. And so that's where when you get into St. Louis, you know, you have a lot of communities that are using um, salt or some some type of salt in the winters. And so there was basically, I think what we're seeing there is some of the impact from road salt. Also what they found is that higher conductivity and conductivity is related to the amount of ions dissolved in water. They saw that that had an effect um, to cause lower invertebrate scores. For the Osage River area, it had an excellent rating for invertebrates, but about 11% of the sites had nitrate values that were over the screening uh, criteria level. So again, this region did have some nitrate issues. And if I'm not mentioning other parameters, I'm, those parameters did not show a, a, a problem necessarily um, as far as stream team water quality goes. So, so far, basically the, the nitrate and the chloride were some of the parameters that had the highest levels of concern as it, as it relates to stream team data. This Gasconade River area had the highest rate of excellent scores for invertebrates and some of the best water quality in the state. The Merrimack River area had about a third of the sites uh, exceeded screening criteria for chloride. And again, we see a lot of those sites are in the St. Louis region. And so I think you're seeing um, impacts from road salt. And again, um, the conductivity, which is the amount of dissolved ions in the water is positively related to chloride. This area south of St. Louis, again, over the screening criteria, almost half. And that was also found that those streams had lower invertebrate scores. I will say road salt's not the only um, source of chloride. You know, uh, humans have high salt content in their diets. And so also in more urban areas, you may have um, more chloride in streams that receive water from wastewater plants. So the combination of those two sources um, likely leading to uh, high chloride. In region nine, the Neosho River, high nitrate, about 50% of the sites exceeded the screening level. Um, but despite this, the invertebrate scores were, were excellent. So that just indicates that there's probably some good in-stream habitat, at least in the streams that were sampled. The White River region down by Table Rock and Lake Tinicomo, again, had about fourth of the sites exceeded nitrate. Otherwise, the water quality was good. For the Black and Current Rivers, they had the highest invertebrate scores of all the regions, but they also had a lower number of assessed sites. So this is our region, you know, with the um, 11 point Kern and Jacks Fork River and their there is an opportunity, there's an opportunity statewide to have more volunteers, but this is specifically one area where, where there is not a lot of uh, volunteer water quality monitoring data. And similar in this re region, the Upper St. Francis and Castor Rivers, there was limited data, only about 13 sites, but the data did not show any exceeding of those screening criteria. And then in our Boot Hill region, um, there were only two assessed sites. So again, a site where we could definitely use some more stream team volunteers. Um, the sites that were assessed though did have a low invertebrate score or a fair score. Um, and many of those streams, as we know, have been changed uh, historically into more channelized ditches 
Um, so there's habitat issues in that region. Okay. What I have, Dana, and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mary, it looks like you have a number of questions in the Q&A box and someone did ask in the chat as well um, if the slide deck would be available for later viewing. So I wanted to wait and make sure you answered that question. Sure, we can do that. I can uh, put it up on the Stream Team Janiya webpage or I can email it to Dana. So um, I'll, I'll put it up on streamteamjanaya.org by tomorrow morning. <laughs> Uh, so check tomorrow and I'll email it. Well, Dana, you have it. So you all can post it on your webinar page if you want to. Great. That'd be great. And we will also have a recording of this so that um, folks can not only see the slide deck again, but they can hear your commentary as well. And I didn't get to all the links I was, I was trying, but there was a lot of good information. So um, I think it'll help folks. Okay, great, thanks, Dana. Um, I'm looking through, okay, I'm looking at the chat. I guess I can, you want me to jump into the Q&A? Sure, yes, that'd be great. There's seven questions right now. Okay, so first question asking about whether Diddy Mo is located in Missouri Streams. Um, so we're talking about invasive organism there. Um, and I am not sure. I'm, I know Amy Meyer, I think is as an attendee and she may know if DNR has done any, or MDC conservation has done any monitoring for that. I'd be happy to um, invite Amy in if, Amy is okay with that. Maybe, and that maybe ask Amy if she knows. I mean, maybe Amy could write us in the chat box if she knows any, if there's any monitoring on Diddy Mo. Um, That's what they call rock snout, right? Yes. So we do um, have Amy. Thanks for joining us, Amy. Hi. <laughs> Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, so as far as um, I don't believe DNR has done any uh, particular sampling for Didymo or has found it. Um, the last that I've heard, and it's actually been a good six or seven years now, the last part of what we knew about Didymo was that it was at our back step. It was um, in Arkansas, in the White River. Um, however, we have not gotten reports that has crossed over into Missouri yet. And, and that's been a while. So I haven't heard anything recently. Um, you know, that's something that we could definitely look into though. Okay, um, next question from Bob, is DNR still collecting data for the Our Missouri Waters Program? So the Our Missouri Waters Program um, is, is not active right now, but that was more of a, watershed planning program with stakeholders to gather input um, and not did not necessarily have data collection involved with it. Um, so the answer there is no, but DNR does data collection. Um, okay, why do we only have water quality data on 10% of the streams with all the data that stream teams enter? Um, it's just 115,000 miles of streams we have. We are blessed with a lot of water in this state, that's for sure. Um, and it'd be great to have more data. There's only so much that our state and federal agencies and universities can cover. Um, and then also data ages. So yeah, it would be great to have more data. And so stream teams, more volunteers, always welcome. How St. Louis area had such higher chloride levels compared to Kansas City. Uh, so this may go back to the stream team volunteers pick their sites. And we actually had one of our stream team volunteers that did a PhD project in the St. Louis region looking at chloride related to um, salt use uh, for 
for reducing ice on roads. And so a lot of that chloride data is coming from St. Louis due to a PhD project and other volunteers that helped. Dan Danielle Hake uh, was the person that did that project and she's now serving as the director of Illinois uh, River Watch. Um, and so she's active there. Okay, is it fair to expect the same level of invertebrate life in northern mud-based streams than in southern spring-fed gravel bottom streams? Um, there are different species present. Uh, the, the types, and so in the stream team program, they identify to order level for, for the organisms and sometimes family level. Um, there, there are definitely, as you say, you know, they're, they're different areas geologically and they, they have different species. Um, so the diversity levels may be different. Um, you can still have similar levels of, of biomass in a sample. It just may be different organisms. Uh, so related, when you're looking at that scale, uh, that, that um, gauge that shows poor to excellent um, is probably uh, better used in the Ozarks region than in the prairie streams uh, because sometimes in, in northern Missouri it has been hard for uh, agencies to find appropriate reference streams and reference streams are those that have been least impacted. So for example when the, the conservation department does fish monitoring um, I don't think their fish index works well in northern Missouri because they have not been able to have uh, basically streams that um, are least impacted to, to compare their test streams to. And Mary, if I can jump in on that, yeah. I mean, it's it's important to keep in mind that we have two. These are two very different hydrogeological areas um, and aquatic faunal areas, and so. Um, the, yes, the species that you're going to find in northern Missouri are definitely going to be much different than what you find in southern Missouri. And I think um, what happens as far as stream team data goes, it's difficult to target those habitats where you're going to find the most diversity and the most biomass um, because of accessibility or, you know, the depth of the stream. And um, perhaps, you know, of course, there's so much more private land in northern Missouri that's harder to access than there is in southern Missouri. So it, it's a lack of data. Um, and also just uh, the diversity of assemblages between the two aquatic faunal regions. So just because it's muddy doesn't mean it's bad. Okay, Joanne, one of our Paddle Mo participants. What is water quality at St. Francis State Park beaches? Okay, so um, that is going to be on the DNR website either at the web page for that state park, or um, I, I'll try to send you a link for that. So it's, it's out there now. Since um, you know we're in October, they're not sampling right now, but that information is available. You you can look before you go. And Bob, one of our stream team volunteers, are similar water quality data available for our big rivers, Missouri River and Mississippi River? Um, there's there's data now that data is collected by the USGS um, and Amy you can you know most most of that the data for our big rivers is collected by our federal agencies um, and for the most part that's going to be fish data rather than macroinvertebrate data um, because there's it's just difficult to collect information on big rivers. There's ways to do it, um, but I don't know if there's been a concentrated effort on getting biological index um, readings on our bigger rivers. But yes, if there are, it would be through USGS. Mm -hmm. And Bob, that's something that in that um, national, national Water Quality Portal page, uh, that's kind of the federal warehouse or for where everything's funneling into, you could search the Missouri River and Mississippi River do that. Um, I had a question about posting my email address. So I'm gonna put that in the chat box right now. It's mary at streamteamsunited.org. I have a, well, I, I hope it's a quick question. I know we're, we're a little past 6.30, but 
I wrote down four questions, but I'm only going to ask one question. Um, so what, can you comment on what might be the biggest threats to our water quality in, in Missouri? Sure. Um, we've been saying for years, I would say that sediment is the number one pollutant of Missouri streams. Um, erosion, it continues to be so, you know, and that comes from land disturbance, also historic channelization that occurred long ago, but also just the disruption of stream channel. So, um, you know, practices that leave roots in the ground, um, native grasses, giving the stream room with a riparian buffer, those are huge practices as far as reducing all pollutants from runoff. But um, if I had to pick one, I would say sediment's been, been a problem, it continues to be a problem, and that sediment carries with it phosphorus, you know, so um, we, we, we have nutrient issues um, in the Midwest that is well known to be affecting the Mississippi River and downstream waters. But again, each local watershed may have its own problem. Just like in St. Louis, we have chloride as a problem. Or if you have um, a poorly functioning wastewater treatment plant, you may have ammonia as a big issue. So uh, we have these broad statewide things, nutrient sediment, you know, individually there could be a number of things. Thank you. Had one question, is there a fish advisory in effect now uh, related to human consumption? There, there always is, and that is published by the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, the Conservation Department and other agencies do the data collection for the fish tissue, but you can go to the DHSS and search for fish advisory, and that's published, I think, yearly and it has guidelines for how much fish people are allowed to eat at different areas. I just found that and I'm gonna put it in the chat. So there's the, the fish advisory. I'm not seeing more questions, Mary and Amy. I'm seeing a lot of, of nice comments in the chat. Um, but I don't think I'm seeing any more questions. Amy, thanks for letting us just grab you out of the ether <laughs> to come yeah. in. And Mary, thanks so much. I just learned a ton of things from you just now and, and was looking at some of the links a little bit. Um, really, really good information. Cool, great. And yeah, thanks thanks to Amy. And I know we had Laura Richardson with DNR with the Stream Team Program, I think. And, and also Jenna, I have them as backups to pull, pull them up to answer anything. So thanks for being here. Um, and thanks to you, Dana, Ethan, and Paige and Missouri River Bird Observatory for letting us talk about this tonight. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, with that, thank you very much and good night to everyone. Have a good night, everybody. Yep.